Hi, everybody. I'm Lee Hambright, U.S. Medical Devices Analyst at Bernstein. I'm thrilled to host Jeff Martha today, Medtronic CEO. Uh, I'd love to thank everyone for joining over video conference. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. First, in lieu of question cards in the room, you'll see a pigeonhole link available on the left side of your screen. Please click on that link to submit questions or to vote on questions that have already been submitted, and we'll make sure we focus the conversation on what interests you. Second, at the end of the session, you'll have access to a two-minute investor poll through ProSensus. So, Jeff, thanks so much for joining. Uh, please kick us off with a, a short intro, and then we'll jump into Q&A. Sure, sure. Thanks, Lee. Um, yeah, I appreciate the invite and looking forward to uh, looking forward to this. So, we, we've got just a couple of, um, you know, just a couple of slides here. I thought they could provide a little bit of context. Gwen, if you could uh, advance to the uh, to the first slide. Uh, of course, we have our forward-looking statements. Um, look, just um, a, a summary here of, um, I think, an executive summary just to kick things off. Uh, you know, I, I know there'll be a lot of questions around COVID, um, and uh, you know, f from our perspective, obviously, uh, you know, it's, it's had uh, you know, obviously, a devastating impact on on, on our society. And you know, look, I start off by saying it, that uh, we just, you know, we're, we're, our thoughts are with those that have been affected. You know, we've had uh, many of employees affected, and 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 of course our, our healthcare uh, our healthcare partners and our, our hats are off, and, and our, our eternal gratitude to all the frontline healthcare workers that have just you know done amazing work. I mean, these, these are our longtime colleagues and friends, and to see what they're doing has has been amazing. Uh, and as as for Medtronic, you know, uh, th this this crisis I think uh, really demonstrates what kind of company we are and. What we stand for, we've been able to uh, continue to invest in our employees, and I'll talk more about that. Invest in our pipeline and and our customer relationships. We're talking to customers more than ever, and the dialogue has changed with them, which I'll, I'll talk to you about. But at the end of the day, we feel we're going to come out of this, uh, you know, merge much stronger, and, and we I, I could feel this already. Um, and getting to the pipeline, you know, we talked about our pipeline well before you know COVID and felt like we had the strongest pipeline in our history coming into COVID and that hasn't changed. You know, we've made progress throughout the COVID and, and one of the key reasons we're, we're, we're so bullish about how we're going to uh, come out of this uh, crisis is, is our, our pipeline. And specifically there's this timely convergence of, of our pipeline coming out with unique hospital needs, which I'll talk about this remote capabilities, uh, virtual capabilities. And we just happened to, you know, have a, a very existing strong um, a position in there, and as we've launched new products, uh, that's even extended uh, our, our what I would call our lead in this, and it's really timely because it's what the hospitals are and our healthcare partners are asking for. And of course, growth from emerging markets. This is for us; it's an independent growth driver. Is emerging markets, and I'll talk about that in a second. You know, it, it continues to grow uh, prior to COVID, double-digit growth for you know 40 quarters in a row. Um, so that, that, and that, we see that coming right back. Um, you know, cash flow conversion, we ended our FY20, uh, even with the, you know, our Q4, which is for those that don't, you know, that don't uh, follow us too closely, we have a very odd fiscal calendar that ends in, uh, and ended at the end of April. So we had quite a bit of COVID exposure in our Q4, you know, half of March, I'd say five to six weeks of full on COVID exposure, um, in, in Europe and US. And of course, obviously the whole quarter with China. And despite that, we still ended the year with a 97% uh, cash conversion, and we're very we're very proud of that. And uh, you know, in terms of our, our long-term uh, earnings, our EPS growth target 8% with a with a nice dividend on top of that to give a we, we think a good shareholder return. And then finally, you know, our, our dividend we have our four, we just announced uh, another uh, you know strong increase in our, our dividend and our Q4 earnings call last week, and uh, this is the 43rd consecutive year of dividend increases. And look at a time. You know, a time when you know a lot of people in med tech, a lot of our competitors, even the bigger uh, competitors in med tech, are raising capital. We're raising our dividend, and I think that speaks to uh, two things: the strength, our, our financial health, uh, and, and our strength of our balance sheet, as well as our commitment to shareholders. So, more on that later. I, when, if you could advance, just a quick snapshot of Medtronic. I'm not going to spend too much on this. This slide, just one uh, mission-driven company, uh, which. Uh, you know, right now, uh, that's been, that's been really helpful, especially as a new CEO. So I took over officially as CEO, uh, in the new fiscal year. So at the end of April and, you know, ha having to make a lot of decisions quickly, 
uh, as a new CEO can be challenging, but the, having the mission there uh, helped a lot, and it, it really clarified a lot of decisions and made my job um, has made my job a lot easier than people might expect in terms of having to be decisive and how to make decisions. Like I said, it's a, it's a real clarifier for us. Um, you know, in the middle there uh, here, the R and D, clinical investments. Like I said, the strongest pipeline we've had in our history. And the thing that I'd say is unique about Medtronic, and, and I think Lee, you know this, is we have a really strong history of what I call therapy innovation in terms of identifying unmet clinical needs and um, really creating new standards of care. Uh, so not just iterative innovation, but whole new standards of care. We, we started the industry, uh, our founder, Obak, when he invented the pacemaker, working with, you know, a cardiac surgeon named Walt Lilhai. And, and, you know, to this day, we're doing new, you know, uh, starting new markets, like we'll talk about renal denervation or disrupting markets, uh, like with the micro. Uh, and, and pacing, and, and that's really who we are, and that's unique. Um, and and then I mentioned emerging markets. Uh, you know, you can see here over 16% of our revenue is coming from emerging markets. That's 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 very large compared to our competitors, and anywhere from you know 40% higher to double uh, our our larger diversified med tech peers. And um, it uh, it it is like I said, an independent growth driver. And you know, Omar, you know, the, the, our prior CEO, who you know, Lee. He, he really uh, pushed this, and um, I intend to keep that momentum going. And under his leadership, you know, it's up to the 16-plus percent of our revenue, growing double, over double digit for 40 quarters in a row. That's, that's pretty amazing. Um, I don't know about before that, uh, but, but for, since Omar's tenure, that's, that's, those are the results. Um, and why don't we go to the next slide here? I'm trying to move this along so we get to the Q&A. Um, okay, there we go. Okay, so... And then, and then the COVID-19 response here, you, you know, you see these three vectors. I, again, I, I, I think, um, like I said earlier, this, 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 uh, this whole thing tested us, uh, COVID-19. And I think we, re we responded well. And I'll put it into three categories. One, our employees, uh, providing them, uh, you know, both, you know, health, safety and, and, and financial security. Uh, so we uh, provide strong financial support. Uh, to all of our employees, for example, our sales force, like in the U.S., that are highly leveraged, uh, where their their compensation is tied to revenue. And obviously, revenue went way down uh, in our Q4, and, and, and again in this, this Q1, and we uh, covered uh, covered their uh, compensation, kept them focused on their customers and not worrying about their their financial health, if you will. Uh, our, our manufacturing employees, we have all kinds of benefits programs, 30-day emergency uh, leave with full pay. Uh, you know, financial assistance for child care uh, and things like that. Uh, you know, I can go on. And then in terms of um, safety, uh, you know, we've, we've done all the social distancing and, 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 the, and the cleaning practices. And, you know, we're like in Mexico, for example, where we had more COVID uh, cases, we actually partnered with a uh, private hospital system there and basically providing concierge medical services for our, our manufacturing, for all of our employees in Mexico, but our manufacturing employees it's a heavy manufacturing base for us. And then uh, another health example for employees is we have a telehealth business, business uh, which uh, during COVID has, has seen an increase. But uh, we added a COVID, a respiratory uh, protocol to that and, and offered that for free to all of our employees and their families. And, it, and this is a remote patient monitoring uh, service that we have with the nurse call center. Uh, we do we, Historically, we've done a lot of, uh, for example, the VA uh, they're chronic comorbid patients. We have like over 100,000 of the uh, veterans on this service. And, and we extended, extended this for a COVID protocol and offering it to our employees uh, for free and their families, quite frankly. So uh, in the middle, we could talk a lot about I, I'll, a summary. Ventilator, uh, the whole ventilator experience over the last couple of weeks is, has been um, extremely rewarding. We've got our internal ventilator capacity up 5x. Uh, by the end of uh, June here, we'll be up five times uh, the, the units per month than we were in January. Plus, we've created, uh, like I said, hundred, in, uh, tens of thousands of capacity with new partners outside the company from all around the world. Uh, this speaks to the partnership. We open sourced one of our key ventilator products, and, and, and out of that came, you know, like 250 or more downloads of our of our of our um, designs. We gave a royalty free license, and we've partnered with five. Companies uh, uh, like Foxconn and, and, and Wisconsin to produce these uh, ventilators. 
and we're getting a, a lot of uh, uptake from these from emerging markets. We also have other partnerships like with Intel to, to remotely control our, our ventilators from outside the, uh, the ICU and remotely monitor them. SpaceX is providing us a critical part that helped us scale the ventilators. So we're, we're very uh, proud of what we've been able to accomplish with the ventilators. And we've built really strong customer and government relations uh, through the, uh, uh, throughout p- the pandemic, uh, largely based on the conversations we've been having around ventilators. And then in the community, our, uh, our foundation stepped up over 36 million in monetary and, and product donations. We're doing a two for one match for our employees that want to give, uh, their money and their time. And, um, we, uh, we have, we've offered some assistance for diabetes patients because a lot of our diabetes patients, uh, are younger. They're not, they don't, in, like in the United States, for example, don't benefit from, from Medicare. And with the job loss that's happened as a matter of COVID and the loss of insurance, uh, um, th- this has been a big program for a lot of our patients. When, if you can go to the next page here, um, so just this is a big one for us. Our, our new products, and I, and I suspect you'll have some questions on this, Leah. Just to, like I said, I, I'm not going to go through all of these. It's, it's a, as the picture shows. We this is a, a really good time for Medtronic in terms of product introductions. You know, one that I'll, I'll talk about is is um, is our cardiac implantables, uh, and, and this is the timely convergence I talked about. We just launched our latest uh, ICD uh, family called Cobalt and Chrome, which has the um, – here, here it is right here – which has the, um, you know, this Bluetooth capability, this distance programming. Uh, it's, the, it's the only device out there that you can – in the United States that you can do distance programming. So the rep is outside of the room. Uh, and can program. Normally, they're in the room with PPE. They're outside of the room. They can program the device. Uh, and, and even the electrophysiologist, the electrophysiologist who's monitoring the case, they can be anywhere in the world uh, and dictating the program parameters, you know, by having a fellow or a resident in the room doing the, the, the procedure. Uh, and then when the, um, the patient has to do a device check, which is pretty regular, uh, they normally would have to come into the hospital for that. Now we can do this all in the comfort of their own home. As a matter of fact, after our earnings call last week, you know, we, you know, we, I was doing some press interviews. One of the reporters stopped and said, Hey, I, I got to thank you, uh, because my wife normally has to come in. She's got a Medtronic pacemaker, normally has to come in for device check. And she was able to, she, we were found out she was able to do it from the home. And I can't tell you how, how much that meant to us as a family. They're, you know, they're very concerned about going in. And, and then of course, you know, you know, Micra has a lot of that same, those same uh, characteristics on the Bluetooth and, and the remote, uh, the remote program. Program it, uh, the, the ability to program it remotely. Of course, this is 93% smaller than the, the conventional pacemaker, and the benefit of this during COVID is is just the, the lower complication rates because the procedure is so much simpler and less invasive. You know, uh, hospitals don't want patients coming back uh, for complication rates, and, and this just makes it a lot easier. You have no leads. It's all self-contained. Like I said, 93% smaller, plus it has Bluetooth capability. So we're really excited about you know, uh, the, the portfolio, you see the soft tissue robot on here where we're, we're entering, you know, uh, the uh, preclinical phase now and you know, the commercialization of this now is, is in sight uh, as we enter the, the preclinical phase. Our neuromodulation portfolio across the whole pain stem, we introduced the new DTM uh, waveform here coming from Stemgenics, which we're getting the best results we've seen for pain, relief of pain. Uh, you know, we're redefining deep brain stimulation with our closed loop, uh, brain sensing technology, or our brain, we, we're, we, it's, we launched what we call Percept, which has brain sensing, the first of its kind, to sense signals in the brain, and we'll shortly be launching a clinical trial, uh, around, uh, to do the, the closed loop for that. So again, that'll redefine the competitive dynamics in DBS, uh, sensing, and we're way ahead on that. And then, uh, Interstim Micro for, for overactive bladder. It's, uh, it's, uh, three cc's. Very small device, uh, much smaller than, than anything that's out there, including our, our latest competitor. And we, right before COVID, we launched it in Europe and, you know, we have a new competitor in that space and they'd taken some share. Our technology was older. Uh, and, uh, within just a couple of weeks, we took half those accounts back before COVID with, with this device. So we're very excited about that. And then as I look forward to the beyond, uh, you know, we've got renal denervation here that this could be a billion dollar market uh, for hypertension. As you know, hypertension is the number one contributor to death around the world. And, and uh, the, the current therapies, about half the patients don't really adhere to them. Uh, this 
this is a, a one-time thing and with, with uh, no side effects. And so assuming the clinical trial goes well here, which should be done in around a, a year or so, it's been delayed a little bit because of COVID. Um, uh, this this is a, a, a hu- could be a huge market for us. We're very excited uh, about that. And then of course our, our, our you know what else did I miss here? Um, uh, you know I think I think I'll uh, I think I'll stop there on on uh, uh, I had one more I wanted to highlight there. What was the other one? Um, well anyway I'll just I'll stop there. Oh the Pilcam Genius that was it. I knew there was one other. The Pilcam Genius is, is another one that, that could be disruptive for, colon, uh, for colonoscopies. As you know, no one wants to do a colonoscopy. This is something with our partnership from Amazon. You know, you, you, we'll send it to you right to your home. You know, you, you do this in this screening in your house. And, uh, you know, if, if it, it, sent, it uses artificial intelligence to identify polyps, commun- and then over the web communicate with your physician to determine if you need to come in for, uh, you know, for further, for further work. Uh, and I think 70% of the time you're fine, uh, but this will make that streamline that process. And it's a, it's a, it's a neat uh, uh, opportunity. It's a great opportunity for us as we move into a more consumer-driven world. So, uh, Win, why don't we go to the next uh, next slide here? Uh, you know, again, again, getting back to ESGs, as you know, is a, is a bigger and bigger uh, focus for investors. And for us, the, this plays right into our sweet spot, being a mission-driven company with several of our tenants talking about different aspects of ESG. Tenant 6 talks about uh, you know, good corporate citizenship. Uh, tenant 5 talks about the personal worth of employees. Tenant, you know, tenant 3 gets into quality. You know, so uh, we have six tenants total, but a lot of them hit ESG, and this is something that's in our DNA. And two things I'll point out here. One is inclusion and diversity, where you know, Omar was very bold here and set very aggressive targets, uh, 40%. Uh, of, of women for women leadership, represent, representation for women in our leadership ranks, which uh, by 2020, which we're, which we're very close to, and, uh, tw- you know, 20% for ethnic diversity and, and management and above, and we've already hit that. Uh, we just won the Catalyst Award, which is the, the biggest award uh, for advancing women in leadership. And I already mentioned our open source, um, you know, uh, project with the ventilator where we put profits, you know, we put, you know, patients before profits. And, and in the end, it's going to make our business better. As I mentioned, these five partnerships that have come out of that. So uh, when next slide here. And then finally, um, kind of early priorities for me, uh, you know, look, the company's, you know, as a new CEO, the, the company's foundation really is therapy innovation. And, and that'll remain that and, and, and really transit, you know, we've got this great pipeline, and in the near term here, we got to make sure that pipeline uh, translates into differentiated growth and market share gain. So obviously that's a big focus. Our diabetes business, you know, the diabetes market's a big market, big patient need. <clears throat> you know, we have a, a market leading position in the type one space, um, but we're losing share there. We, we've got to reinvigorate that business and, and fully participate in all aspects of the diabetes market. And then finally, uh, I want to drive a high a high performing culture. So we're a very mission driven company, but there's certain obstacles that we have. The size of our company's created some bureaucracy that we need to cut through. Uh, I'd like to heighten the sense of urgency that we demonstrated during COVID-19 here in terms of you know redesigning our ventilator, partnering with Intel, redesigning our ventilator in two weeks, so we, based on some customer uh, requests. I mean that kind of sense of urgency and speed and responsiveness to competitors uh, is the thing that we, we need to bring that kind of attitude to the office every day or, or the remote office, depending where you are and, and really focus on market share. Uh, we've got, I, you know, we've got all the fundamentals here, but adding this high performance culture is a big deal uh, and, and putting this market share mindset into the entire organization, not just our sales reps, but the entire organization, I think will, will help, uh, you know, improve our growth here and, and, um, and make it more, uh, more consistent. So I think that's all I had. You know, uh, I ran through that kind of quickly, but I wanted to provide some context before we just jumped right in, Lee. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks, Jeff. That's great context. Thank you. Um, so maybe you know, jumping in and, and talking about a little bit about um, your priorities as you take the CEO role. You know, as a, as a global med tech leader, uh, Medtronic participates in a very wide range of different therapeutic areas and markets around the world. As you've transitioned into your new seat uh, over the past six months, uh, what are the businesses or geographies that have surprised you most and you know where have you been spending most of your time 
Well, look, as you know, before, you know, I've been at Medtronic now for, for nine years and the, the group that I ran before. So we have cardiology, uh, neuroscience, uh, surgery, which is basically legacy COVIDian, and then our diabetes business. Um, and so one of the big the learning curve for me was getting deeper uh, in the non-neuroscience areas. I mean, there's a lot of products. You said we participate in a lot of markets. We have a lot of products. And, and getting to the depth, uh, and I, I'm still working on that. I haven't solved that. I haven't cracked that code. Uh, of the other products has been, because there's a lot of new things happening. And um, like I said, a priority for me is innovation-driven growth. And so you really need to understand uh, where, the, where the opportunities are, where the patient need is, where the market growth is, and allocate that pro- that capital properly. I felt like you had a good understanding of how to allocate capital within our neuroscience group, as you know, called RTG. Uh, but how do you allocate? What's the best opportunities to allocate capital across across the company? And, and that's where I've been spending a lot of time and working with our business leaders uh, and, and, and like our group leaders that run these these the, the cardiovascular group, the, the neuroscience group, the, the diabetes business, and the surgery business, you know, working together on uh, on more decisive and aggressive capital allocation. In terms of business, I've been the most surprised with it has probably our cardiac implantables. In terms of, you know, that's been a business that that's a market that's been slower growth, uh, and and for us, you know, we have a big position there. We have we we have not outgrown the market, and uh, but you know. But as I meet with this business, a guy named Mike Marinero runs a, a big piece that he runs that business. There's a lot of energy right now, a lot of excitement, you know, between, I mentioned earlier, all the need of healthcare systems around the world for um, the remote capabilities. And we just happen, we've always prioritized that. And I don't, I don't know that that's really resonated quite as much with the market, but now it is. And we have that leading portfolio and we're adding to it with this Cobalt and Chrome launch for our high power. And, and just the, the share that we you – know, the uptake that seems to be happening out there, I, I'm really excited about. You can feel it. Talking to customers, they're like, I've talked to some big uh, um, hospital systems that are saying, look, we, we're going to make this remote thing the, you know, uh, a standard. And, and if they do that, and as they do that, we will benefit from that. And then Micra. Uh, I showed you the Micra earlier. I mean, it, it, even in April, our worst month, the bottom, it grew 20%. So the rest of the company, you know, we, you know, we were – shrinking quite, and you know, we were down quite a bit. Micra's growing 20%. And, and, and in the months leading up to COVID, it was growing 60%. So taking a lot of share. So that whole business um, is, is in, in a great spot. And, and, and you take a step back, our three biggest businesses, cardiac rhythm, spine, uh, and our surgical innovations business uh, from COVID, and all three of those are in great spots right now to, to take share for a variety of different reasons. So, uh, you know, so that, that, that's mean to me has been a, a pleasant surprise, cardiac in particular. Great, great. So we've heard you. Uh, we've heard you specifically emphasize uh, at least a couple of strategic priorities. Either, number one, the opportunity to simplify and streamline Medtronic's corporate bureaucracy, and number two, uh, the need to focus uh, not just on creating new markets but on maintaining market share. Right. Uh, you know, moving the goalposts forward as the competition intensifies. And maybe just taking each of those two priorities in turn, I uh, wonder if you could talk about some specific plans that you're most excited about in those areas. I think um, I'll, I'll talk about at a high level here, you know, on simplification, like, like, like we talked about, especially after COVID, and the company is very big um, and in a lot of different areas, uh, therapy areas as well as geographies. Um, and, you yeah, know, but med tech, it, it moves fast. It's based on innovation. And moves relatively fast. And so what we are working on with the, myself and the rest of the executive committee is putting more empowerment down into our businesses uh, and, 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 and changing Medtronic from like a, a $30 billion business made up of like three big business groups to more of $31 billion businesses. I mean, we may not get the $31 billion. It may be less than that. Maybe it's 20 businesses that are a little bit, but and, and, and pushing more of the decision-making down to them. Um, and uh, I think uh, that is something that uh, kind of got away from us after COVIDian, I think. And, and it, even before COVIDian, it had kind of gotten away from us a little bit. And so kind of taking this opportunity of a leadership transition to push that down. And, and so you'll have more visibility to those businesses, those business leaders, their priorities. And you know, if the decision, uh, as much decisions as possible with them, I think it's going to help us a lot. But And then holding them, but in parallel to that, it gets back to the, the 
um, the market share component, right? Is not just creating new markets and then letting others come in and take take share from us. Is creating those new markets and maintaining them, or even entering new markets where we're not like in surgical robotics, where we're not just shoes on the other foot. There's a big player out there. We get to go in there and take share. But having that market share mindset. So it's a matter of it's not just cultural, but it's changing our incentive plans around market share. And, and we're in that process right now of adding share to uh, much more a bigger component to kind of our performance goals. So, you know, you're keeping your job <laughs> uh, and, and then and, and over time compensation as well. Got it. Great. You know, uh, it, Medtronic, like you said, it's a it's a mission mission driven company. I've still got my mission medallion. Uh, <laughs> oh, great to see where I got mine right here too. Like, <laughs> keep it on my desk. Here you That's go. Great. I love it. <laughs> you know, uh, it, the, the the culture of heritage, uh, the, the the heritage of uh, innovation runs deep. Uh, you know, how, how do you think about uh, adjusting that culture and amplifying you know certain pieces of it without uh, you know moving too far away from from the heritage? Well, look, I, I, I'm convinced uh, that we can be a mission-driven company and a more competitive company, uh, you know, at, at the same time, right? There's no, there's no, nothing in the mission that, that says that you know you can't go take share, uh, and and so that is kind of my fundamental belief, and and we're we're not um, by emphasizing more on share and and a more of an edge in the company. Uh, won't take away from our mission. I, matter of fact, look, I do believe in a number of our therapies. We have a, a big lead, uh, and it's just better for patients. Uh, and and so I I fundamentally believe that, and we just got to go out there and uh, get this in the hands of more patients and more physicians. And that's you know, it takes a competitive or organization to do that. So I think you can do both. And the other thing is. Um, another key piece of the heritage beyond the mission and putting patients first uh, and emphasizing quality um, is the therapy innovation and taking what I call, you know, bets. I, I, when I first came to Medtronic, I, I was just blown away, and I still am, about the kind of, you know, I, I, are there prudent bets, things like, you know, renal denervation or, or disrupting our pacemaker business with the, uh, with the Micra or, you know, disrupting the spine business with robotics, and uh, these are these type of bets uh, Medtronic makes. Um, and, you know, they don't all work out, or like a core valve, you know, for for Taver, you know, that one really worked out. But they don't all work out. But by and large, they they our batting average is pretty good, and we got to keep doing that. And so we won't change from that. I'm not gonna, you know, I you have to balance that with iterative innovation. Uh, the iterative stuff really helps you with the share, uh, maintain that share. But the inventing new markets or disrupting them really gets the growth. Uh, those are big shots in the arm to growth, big shot in the arm to the, the healthcare systems and patients. And then the it, balancing it with some iterative helps us keep the share. Yeah, got it. You talked about allocating capital across the businesses and, and the, the importance of invention. You know, as, as you made your way around the businesses and uh, you know, saw all of these bets, are, were, were there any uh, maybe smaller ones that, haven't gotten a lot of airtime yet where you thought, boy, these guys have lightning in a bottle. We got to you know, really ramp up investment here. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think we do. We do have a number of them. Like I think our pelvic health space as, as a new competitor comes in and, and there's been a lot of focus on that. We've uh, had the, you know, in terms of neurostimulation for overactive bladder, we've been the only one in that market for a long time and new competitor came in and, there's been a lot of focus on that market. I, I see a lot of innovation coming there to make that therapy, uh, you know, continue to be smaller and less invasive. And there's a lot of patients um, that turn away from it because of the it's a it's a neurostimulator that's implanted. And I think there's going to uh, through miniaturization and, and new algorithms. I mean, that that therapy will open itself up to a lot more patients around the world. We talked about PillCam Genius at the beginning, so our GI business. I think that's a very interesting business to disrupt, you know, uh, the, the colon, you know colon cancer space with the, uh, in terms of uh, the, the PillCam Genius. To think you could swallow a pill uh, in your own home and, and replace a colonoscopy, you know, someday. These are things I think need, uh, you know, continue to need more to more uh, more investment. The other one is diabetes. Um, it's a big market. I talked about it being we're being behind there, and you know, a lot of questions. Uh, you know, it's, it, 
you know, just to be frank, people question, is Medtronic like the right owner? And we haven't really managed that business well. I, I, I got to um, kind of accept that critique that critique that we haven't, uh, I, I don't think. But I, as we put a new leadership in there, and we've taken a hard look at it. And, and you know, for me coming in new, uh, it's an opportunity to relook at it. And, and we did that. And I feel really good about the pipeline. Uh, in, and it's just a matter of time. You know, being, we're not – in order to kind of catch up, we don't have to invent new things. We just have to ex- execute on our, pi- our pipeline, and we feel like it's adequately de-risked. And I wish it were sooner, but, you know, I, but that's an area we've put a lot more investment in, uh, you know, even than before, because I, I do believe in the market. I do believe in our capabilities there. You know, while you're talking about diabetes, you know, uh, maybe, as you said, Medtronic's heritage is about really working with surgeons, identifying unmet needs and innovating new therapies. But diabetes is a, a different type of business for yeah. Medtronic in that it's, you know, it's much more focused on the consumer. You know, how, how does it fit within the company? And, you know, what do you need to do to kind of stem the share loss on pumps? Well, obviously on, on, on pumps uh, as well as CGM, uh, it's pretty easy on what to do to stem the share loss. <laughs> we just have to get our pipeline out there. We have the, the technology. Uh, we've got great algorithms, right? So it, it, in uh, kind of insulin-dependent diabetes today, so kind of more insulin-dependent type 2s and type 1s, it's the, it's the whole sensor, pump, and algorithm, and, and the, the confluence of all those. We've got what I would argue is the market-leading algorithms, but our sensing uh, is behind uh, uh, the key competitor there. And, and, and um, you know, our pumps, uh, I don't know, we're, we're not behind there, but I think there's some, there's some features there that we just got to get out. And, and then the whole system that, together, I believe, is a winning combination. So we just have to get the, the 780G out the door here and eliminate some of the hassle factor of our current, our, our current product. Um, but how does it fit? I, I think, look, med tech is going to move more towards consumer, Right. And the diabetes business, um, although right now we're a little behind and, and losing some share, we will catch up. And I'd like to think that we can put, b- based on our the breadth of what we have between the algorithms, the, the sensing, uh, you know, the continuous glucose sensing, pumps, uh, as well as this this great um, uh, patient resources around field resources and call center that that help patients. Um, uh, which is differentiated. I think we can come up with a, a differentiated strategy that we're working through right now. Um, but beyond that, it is a consumer-driven business, both product design and consumer marketing. And I do think other segments of med tech are going that way. And we need to learn, use the diabetes business to learn. I mean, like Ardian, I do think for that to be as disruptive as it could be, we're going to have to do more direct to consumer. Even to cardiologists, there's so many cardiologists out there, they're almost like another form of a consumer, right? Um, we're used to talking to specialists, uh, and but cardiologists and general generalist physicians, you know, GPs and and, and consumer marketing, I think, will be key, key to Ardian's success, assuming the clinical data comes back with the results that we expect. So I think diabetes does. We have to get more consumer oriented. I mentioned the GI, the GI, uh, the pill cam genius for colonoscopies. Again, another consumer. That'll be another consumer play. So in our pipeline, we have a lot of consumer activity. And, uh, and diabetes, we're learning a lot. We'll leverage some of the capabilities that we're building there from consumer product design and consumer marketing to other parts of Medtronic. Great. Here's a follow-up on diabetes. You, know, this, you have this trend in diabetes toward this interoperability where you get, you know, a pump from one place and a CGM from another place and an algorithm from another place. You know, how, does, how does that affect uh, – I think the Medtronic diabetes strategy is most, has generally been about breadth, the breadth of the solution, being able to bring all the components you know, how does that change the game a little bit in diabetes? Well, right now it, it, it's changed it in that, um, like you said, when we had the, the only one with that whole system, um, that was a that was a bigger competitive advantage. Uh, I mean, it still is a competitive advantage. Again, it's the it's all three of the the components: the the algorithm, the pump, and the sensor, plus our customer care, our customer support. Uh, because of our, that, we that we've had to build up over you know the past 15, 20 years is second to none uh, and d- does take scale to support that. I, you know, it took us a long time to build it up uh, and it, it is expensive. So taking that all together is still an advantage. But when you have the interoperability, you have to, each component has to be kind of at least tied 
for the best. And, and, and right now, uh, and then when you put them all together, uh, it is an advantage. But if you have a weak link in that mix, it hurts. And, and that's what we're feeling right now. So it, our weak links aren't as uh, protected as they used to be. And so that's just, that's just the truth. So we've got to fix those weak links, which right now is, is CGM. Got it. Great. Um, so as we, maybe let's uh, zoom back out and talk about the shape of the recovery a little bit in uh, post-COVID. You know, as, as we think about uh, the shape of recovery for elective procedures, um, you know, there's going to be constraints on both supply and demand. You know, maybe starting on the supply side, there's, there's clearly a limit to how far hospital capacity can flex up to make up deferred procedures. Now, how do you think investors should quantify that, ce that ceiling on capacity? Uh, you know, what are you seeing out there so far at, in hospitals? It's hard to quantify that, but um, look, we're seeing hospitals operate already um, in the U.S., for example, at like 110, 115% of, of their historical capacity. And, they, and they're doing things, um, they're having to, I think, partner with, pick partners. So hospitals have to do more with less, but also less vendors. And they have to pick partners and, and, and give it in our position right now and our ability to the actions we took during the crisis has put us in a nice position to be one of the, the, the partner of choice in med tech. And, and so we've had to work with them, for example, on how do you, how, how do you have more productive ORs or, or cath labs? And we have a lot of experience with that. I think you probably heard about our hospital solutions business that we have in, in Europe and the Middle East that, where we actually run cath labs. And so bringing some of that expertise into it, in the U.S. cath labs to make them more productive. These are things that are happening. You know, the other things they're doing at, during this time is like even um, robotic assisted surgery, like, uh, you know, for general surgery, that takes longer uh, per procedure. Uh, the setup, the procedures take longer. So I do think robotic it, robotics is here to stay, and, and there's a huge growth opportunity for the industry uh, but during this COVID phase, I mean, there's just doing less robotic procedures. Uh, now, it's going to come back, but they're doing less, and it's more MIS uh, because it's faster. Uh, and, and so the hospitals are making moves like that, partnering with companies, and we're one of those partners to help be more productive. They're, they're, they're kind of being more selective about how they do their procedures, like you gave the MIS versus robotic procedure uh, case, and, and that they're working on weekends, working longer hours. So I don't know how to quant where where the cap is, um, but they're definitely we're seeing large systems at least up to 115% right now, and I, I don't know that it'll stop at 120. And I I don't, I don't know how long they'll be able to operate at those levels, but there's a bolus of patients coming through right now, and they're hap and they've adjusted very well, uh, including all the social distancing and and and, and keep taking care of their employees, and, and we've helped them with that as well a little bit. So. You mentioned, uh, you know, you mentioned um, uh, robotics versus MIS. Uh, you know, in, in this environment, in this recovery period, uh, do you think there's an opportunity for Medtronic to kind of take back some of that uh, procedural share in, um, you know, in MIS? Yeah, but we're expecting that. Yeah, we're like I said, our surgical innovations business is well positioned right now. Um, we used the COVID-19 period. Uh, we kept our factories running. Our, our SI business. It, uh, you know, largely MIS, a ro robot's not on the market yet, uh, and a leader in MIS has taken share over the last couple of years from its biggest competitors, uh, biggest competitor in that MIS space. Um, but despite uh, for the last, I'd say, two years, constant supply problems, one thing or another, it was sterilization, we just didn't have the right capacity, a hurricane, you name it. We've had all kinds of issues that have created supply problems. We use the COVID-19 time frame to keep those factories going and, and, and fix those supply problems. So I, they're coming out of COVID now with full supply for the first time s since the Covidian acquisition. Uh, and, and, and then on top of that, and that's a more of a sustained advantage on top of that for a period of time, uh, robotic procedures will be down. And so that should help us. Now that, that only lasts for a period of time and, and robotic procedures will come back and we want them to come back. We're investing heavily in that space, but it, it, for, that, that 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 is a short-term benefit for us. Yeah, great. Um, your balance sheet is strong, uh, right. and you know you showed your commitment to, to leveraging that balance sheet um, uh, in your fourth quarter results. And you know margins took a hit, of course, and they'll get a little bit worse in the near term. But, but you expect operating margins to rebound and uh, back to normal levels by the end of your fiscal year. 
We do. And many of your competitors at the same time have been much more aggressive with cost cutting. So this was a, a big strategic decision for you earlier in your, in your tenure. And can you walk us through a little bit your thought process uh, to invest more aggressively through the pandemic? Yeah, you know, so um, two comments. You know, one, uh, we did invest heavily during the, the pandemic. We invested by not cutting. Uh, it enabled us to keep our employees focused. Um, keep them focused, like our field resources, our manufacturing uh, resources, our, our, people, uh, 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 our team that's doing the finished good distribution. We kept them um, uh, fully focused, uh, put them uh, uh, to full work, and uh, that is, um, and then that's allowed, like for example, our field teams to partner with, with customers. Like so, in, in our customers' hour of need, you know, our field team was out there and not worrying about you know their compensation or. Uh, and, you know, we provide a lot of health benefits to the family. So I, it, it just helped us, I think. And, and we focused on these customer solutions and I think strengthened our, our, our position. Uh, and so, because I do think that this is more of a, uh, we could talk about the new normal, but there's going to be a, you know, a healthy recovery here back to some new normal that is still a very good market. And we want to, we want to take, uh, when that, what, however big that new pie is, we just want to, we think we want a bigger slice of that pie. And so that's why we invested. Plus, we have all these products coming out. I mean, we just could not waste the opportunity for this pipeline that we've been building uh, to come out of COVID and not be fully ready to launch those products. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing is, down the road, though, I, I did talk. One thing we do need to do is is uh, simplify the company a bit. So we're that that is something is more of a strategic move versus you know uh, reacting to COVID. Uh, let's talk about CVG a little bit. You're, you're operating from a position of strength and rhythm in the CRHF where you've got Micra in pacing and your Cobalt and Chrome launches in high power, you know, building on your number one share position. Structural Heart CSH has been a little bit of a different story where you're, you're losing share in Taver. Uh, competition's getting increasingly intense there with the launch of a couple new entrants. Yep. Uh, you had some issues in Q3 related to underinvestment in the field. What, what does it take to get into a share taking mode in Tavern? You know, um, we have to talk to Mike Coyle about the specific, all the new, the new uh, things that are coming out in Tavern. But I can tell you this, uh, we made those field investments. So those, those, uh, and that takes some time, right? We, we, uh, they have to go through training and have to be ready. And the, that training is coming to a conclusion. You know, so we feel our field is in a much better spot. I think I think the messaging, look, the, the products ours versus the competitors, they're different, right? And and they have different, I think, pros and cons, at least. You know, and and tightening up our marketing message to so and it, and really focusing more uh, so the uh, the physicians truly understand what the benefits of that product are. Uh, look, we're seeing um, we're seeing account conversions here, and I, I feel much better, and I know Mike does too, about where we stand right now with with, with Taver. Uh, so I, I, over the last couple of weeks, I, where I, the part I've been involved with more has been tightening up our marketing message, getting making sure those field resources are ready to go, and specifically t- visiting you know virtually and even my last customer visit before everything shut down in the pandemic was a a Tabria site that just recently uh, fully transitioned uh, from the competition, and I, I just wanted to understand you know why because uh, they'd all been you know proctored and, and educated by the competitor and they did a full uh, you know switch and you know basically said look it was the broader a broader cardiology contract that we put in place that ha- helped uh, enable that but all these surgeons they you know they felt like they could do all the cases uh, that even though they were trained with the competitor with our product and and it's a matter of educating them on the pros and cons and you know, I think we're 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 in better shape than we were but I and we'll see where the share where the share dynamics go here in the next couple quarters. Great. Maybe uh, so. Renal denervation has been a big focus area for investors. You know, huge burden of treatment resistant hypertension. Um, you've uh, presented some promising data at ACC. How are you currently thinking about the size of that market opportunity and the potential rate of therapy adoption? So this is an area I, I, I'm very excited about, and for a number of reasons. One, the size of the market. You know. Um, yeah, you know, we're talking about it could be a billion dollar market. Um, again, we feel confident. You know, as you know, we did the the uh, the off med uh, results, and, and we're bullish on the on med, but we'll see. 
Um, we've been surprised before, but uh, based on the way the trials designed, based on all the changes we made to the product itself, as well as the procedure, uh, we feel we've we've got it right. But we'll, we'll see how the, the trial comes out. And like I mentioned before, this is an area that I believe uh, represents a huge opportunity j just in and of itself uh, uh, for the treatment of patients with hypertension, but also to help Medtronic extend our uh, consumer capabilities here. Uh, so again, the, what we're talking about is, is a potential billion dollar market. You know, I'll continue to learn more about that and, and refine those numbers, but that's kind of how we're thinking about it right now. So, uh, conscious of time, I know people want to hear about robotics. Uh, you know, it's been a big investment area for you in surgical robotics. Uh, you know, as, as you said before, Medtronic's accustomed to opening up new markets and then working to fend off entrants. You know, this is a, a different type of challenge for the company. You know, what, what does it take to build this business and take share in surgical robotics? Well, one, we got to get the, the rope. We got to build a robot here and get it out the door. I mean, it, it's a complicated. You know, we did it organically. I mean. Yes, Covidian got some technology early, early on, but by and large, it's been an organic program. It's a very complicated program, um, and it's taken longer than we'd like, but we want to get it right. Um, and, you know, the, the latest um, uh, issues have been over the last year have been around software, which we feel we've crossed over that and, and are really close to a starting, like, you know, any day preclinical uh, pre testing. So we got to get that, keep that keep going on that schedule. COVID slowed it down a bit, you know, because of uh, you know, to do preclinical. I mean, it does involve getting people together, and that's been a little more difficult. But um, but we'll, we feel we'll get it back on track here, and, and, and we're very excited about the capabilities. I think the other thing we have to do, and I, I, I wouldn't say this has not been a strength for Medtronic historically, and I mentioned it in Tabo, is clearly communicating in a, in a simple way what our – you know, what, what are the benefits of this product? And, and uh, we have some clear benefits. Uh, you know, the, the, the U.S. surgical legacy COVID and U.S. surgical end effectors are in stapling and energy are, are market leaders and taking share. And they've been taking share for a long time. And this system will benefit from that. It's more flexible than the competitor in terms of you can, the arms are all together and, and you can, you can, you don't need all four arms for every procedure and you can move them around and, there's some real clinical benefits from our end effectors. There's economic benefits from the business model and the, the configuration of the robot. And we got to get that out there. And, and finally, we, we have to build it and have a good service capability, which will leverage the service capabilities that, that are coming out of RTG for their imaging equipment, navigation, and their uh, Azor spine robot. So we'll have that to leverage and build from, from a service capability. And we're building our commercial team now. Uh, we've learned a lot from Azor. We've learned a lot. It's different, the segment, but there's a lot of similarities, and, and so we've got to leverage those learnings. And, and um, I, I feel I, I'm excited about them. I'm, I'm excited because the competitor that we're going after is strong, uh, which which uh, which gets me excited uh, is to take on that kind of challenge. Great. I've got an audience question about China. You know, the, the U.S.-China relationship uh, seems increasingly uncertain. It's a growing fo focus on nationalized supply chains. I know you've spent uh, a lot of time personally in China right. starting, starting years ago with the Conway deal. Um, how, how do you think about Medtronic's outlook in China, and are you considering any adjustments to your supply chain? Well, from a – let me just answer the supply chain piece first. Um, so not – our supply chain – you know, we had that hurricane a couple of years ago. We learned something around business continuity from that. You know, we were exposed – to the hurricane in Puerto Rico more than we, we would have liked. And so I, I feel like our, our business leaders and our operations leaders have the right business continuity in place. And our exposure to China from a supply perspective is manageable. We've got uh, – so that's not something that's been a problem, and we don't anticipate it uh, being a big problem, but we'll continue to watch that. Uh, but the longer term – you know, our – look – China's a huge market, and there's a lot – I mean, obviously, there's 1.4 billion patients. There's more physicians than any other market in the world. It will be the largest healthcare market, and we have to be a leader there. And the path to leadership um, is – we have a really good base there, over a $2 billion business. We've got already local manufacturing, local products. We've got uh, great partnerships with various um, uh, provinces. 
a huge footprint of, of education centers there. We're building a new one in Chengdu, a state-of-the-art educa physician education center. Um, and we have, you know, hundreds, uh, a couple hundred, uh, over 300 engineers there to do local innovation. But we have to take we have to take that to another level. I basically what I'm what uh, I'm I'm suggesting the company does is basically localize another Medtronic in China. You know, it's that big of an opportunity, and we need to localize uh, a lot more of our products. And, and we we should it justifies a bolus of investment to localize more products there. And what I mean by localize, not just manufacturing, but the local R and D doing that same. That the patients aren't all that different. It's not a physiological difference between, you know, a Chinese patient and a, and a, and a Western patient. It's more the health systems are different, and there's a lot more volume. The physicians get a lot less training, so our products have to behave differently. So those need to be designed specifically for that health system. That health system is starting to demand it, and the government is demanding a, a, a favoring for sure local companies. And so we are uh, uh, preparing for even more of that behavior whether it's a carrot or a stick uh, in terms of tariffs or whatever. So I, our, our, our long-term outlook on China is bullish. We want to localize more. Um, and if, if trade barriers go up, uh, we want to have a, a locally contained ecosystem there. Um, but I think long-term, my personal view um, is that China needs the U.S. and the U.S. needs China economically. And, and over time, um, we, there'll, there'll be a pragmatic approach here. Uh, we're running out of time, unfortunately, but I've got to ask you, this is the Strategic Decisions Conference. So, you know, when, when you look ahead to the next, uh, you know, to your tenure yeah. uh, as CEO, you know, what do you see as the top couple strategic decisions and, and, and how do you think about those? Sure. I mean, like we just talked about one, China. I mean, I, I do think, especially now where people are questioning, I, 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 uh, but I just gave you my answer there. It's just a question of how much uh, you put in there. Um, but China is a big one. Uh, for us, I mentioned, you know, getting – Building up more consumer muscle uh, is is another one for us. Um, yeah, I, another uh, another big one would be um, uh, AI and data. These are we have a number of plays there. We, we've bought a company in diabetes that helps with AI for our, our diabetes algorithms. We just bought a company out of London called Digital Surgery to put AI into our robotics platform. Um, we've got uh, we have a partnership with Viz AI and Stroke, which is a AI platform that helps identify, uh, you know, potential uh, strokes uh, through imaging uh, for healthcare systems. Uh, we have a, we have a lot more data scientists than I, I knew about in our cardiac rhythm business, designing their algorithms. But having a broader AI play across the company is a big strategic decision and investment that that we need to make. Today is focused, but it's too narrow, and I I think we need to step that up. Um, and the other one that's that's Come, uh, uh, um, come up more recently is the virtual everything. I mean, the, the virtual, you know, how do you uh, uh, virtual case support uh, for procedures, virtual device programming, virtual patient management or remote patient management. As I mentioned, we have a lot of that built into our technology. We have a remote patient, a separate remote patient management business that is not tightly connected to our core business. We bought it a number of years ago to learn this, and, and now that's looking like a good investment. Uh, and, and taking a step forward in telehealth and remote is, I'd say, a fourth. But those are some big ones uh, that, that we need to, uh, to continue to think about. Excellent. Awesome. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. I wish we had another hour to get through all the interesting parts of Medtronic's business. Yeah. But, uh, thanks so much, Jeff, for joining. I just remind investors to click on the ProSensus link on the left side of your screen for just a short survey on Medtronic. Uh, Jeff, thanks so much. Really appreciate hey, thanks, it. Thanks for, thanks for having me. It's great. Thank, Thank you. you.